Episode 59. There is one week for dreams of summer, vegetables, and warm sea breezes. We love you, February Thaw. Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxent General. I am your host, Jess. And speaking of garden tips, don't forget to buy your seeds right away for this growing season. This week we have a lovely blueberry lemon drop martini with a nice pucker. We also have a local favorite, grape nut pudding, not to mention folklore of the devil right here in Rhode Island. But first, we need to thank our Patreon subscribers. These seafaring folk are the quahogs, rakes, buckets, bonfires, and clambakes that are the Patuxent General, without whom we would merely be low tide. If you would like to be one of these local clamming folk, just look for our page on patreon.com or simply follow the link in the show notes. But right now, let's make a blueberry lemon drop martini. I was sitting around the general after hours the other day and felt like a cocktail, but not wanting to run around for ingredients, I poked around the building for ideas and found a little blueberry vodka, a handful of blueberries, and two lemons. This plus a little sugar and I'm in. It was so much fun that I had to share it with you. For this blueberry lemon drop martini, you will need... A quarter of a cup sugar aside for the rim, two ounces blueberry vodka, a martini glass, a shaker, a pot, ice, two lemons, a box grater or plain, a handful of blueberries, three quarters of a cup of water, three quarters of a cup of sugar. Let's start with the lemons. Zest them both. Put half the zest into the quarter cup of sugar for the rim. Hang on to the other half for just a little bit. Then put the blueberries and the three-quarter cups of sugar into the pot. Then add a three-quarter cup of water to the pot. Bring it to a simmer until the sugar dissolves. Then add the juice of one of the lemons and zest off the heat. When it cools, add one ounce to the shaker, the juice of the other lemon, the ice, and the blueberry vodka. Give a very enthusiastic shake. Then take your leftover lemon piece and wipe the rim and roll through the sugar and zest. Strain your chilled, shaken drink into your glass and enjoy. I did. Grape Nut Pudding Post Cereals addresses the question, what's in a name? Grape Nuts actually contains neither grapes nor nuts. It is made from wheat and barley. So why is it called Grape Nuts? Well, actually, there are two versions of this story. One says that Mr. Post believed glucose, which he called grape sugar, formed during the baking process. This, combined with the nutty flavor of the cereal, is said to have inspired its name. Another explanation claims that the cereal got its name from its resemblance to grape seeds or grape nuts. Post cereal also talks about the historical impact of grape nuts, In 1933, Post Grape Nuts sponsored Sir Admiral Byrd's expedition to Antarctica, where the first two-way radio transmission occurred. In 1933, Post Grape Nuts sponsored Sir Admiral Byrd's expedition to Antarctica, where the first two-way radio transmission occurred. At the time, maps of the expedition even appeared on Grape Nuts boxes. It was a huge milestone in the scientific community, and Grape Nuts helped make it possible. During World War II, operations before 1944, Grape Nuts was a part of the jungle rations that helped fuel U.S. and Allied forces on extended missions to Panama and other tropical parts of the world. And then much later on, Grape Nuts was briefly at the forefront of the return to nature movement, sweeping parts of the country in the 1960s and 70s. After being paired with wild food expert turned spokesperson Yule Gibbons, his appearance in 1974 commercial for Grape Nuts, which featured Gibbons uttering the famous line, Ever eat a pine tree? Many parts are edible turned him into a pop culture sensation and turned grape nuts into the cereal for health conscious breakfast lovers man which is how it ended up in our parents home the house in the corners cupboards were always full of grape nuts just in case mom or i wanted to make a bowl of grape nut pudding if someone in the extended family was sick they got grape nut pudding giant dish for the church on the fly 
grape nut pudding. Even dad would help himself to grape nut pudding. Have it with whipped cream or ice cream, hot or cold. It always hits a spot. The following recipe is from Post Cereals itself. But I must admit, my family puddings never had bananas. For this recipe, you will need three cups of 2% milk, one cup of heavy cream, a half a cup of sugar, one tablespoon vanilla extract, three whole eggs, three egg whites, three cups 2% milk, one cup heavy cream, one half cup sugar, one tablespoon vanilla extract, three whole eggs, three egg whites, six cups cubed whole wheat bread, three cups grape nut cereal, two ripe but firm bananas cut into large cubes, and two tablespoons of butter. Preheat your oven to 350 degrees. Lightly spray sides and bottom of a 13 by 9 by 2 inch glass baking dish with cooking spray. Heat the milk, cream, and sugar in a heavy saucepan over medium-high heat. Stir until the sugar dissolves and tiny bubbles form around the edge. Mixture should be almost, but not quite, at a boil. Then remove from the heat. Mix eggs, egg whites, and vanilla in a large bowl to blend. Gradually add hot milk mixture to the egg mixture, stirring with a whisk to prevent eggs from cooking. Add the bread cubes and grape nut cereal to the warm egg milk mixture and let stand until the bread and cereal absorb some of the custard, stirring occasionally about 30 minutes. Heat your saute pan over medium high heat and add the butter. Once melted, add the diced bananas and saute for three minutes or until lightly browned. Add bananas to the bread cereal mixture, stirring gently to combine. Transfer into prepped baking dish. Then cover with foil and bake at 350 degrees for 50 minutes or until browned and set. Wait until it's fully cooled before you put it in the refrigerator, but enjoy it hot or cold. Either way, you'll dig grape nut pudding. This just in. So during my time recuperating, I got a chance to make this recipe and it has vast differences from the one I used as a kid. There are no bread cubes, bananas, or egg whites. And frankly, after trying the banana version, although I like bananas, I am not a fan of them in my grape nut pudding. I believe that I grew up with the local version. Check out newengland.com for the recipe I knew. I'm going to try it again and see if it gives me the feeling that I'm looking for. So stay tuned. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. And now, more supernatural folklore of Rhode Island from 1956, the University of Rhode Island, by Idola Jean Bergese. Chapter 2, The Devil in Rhode Island Whenever the devil visited Rhode Island, he was able to outwit his opponents with ease. In Massachusetts, men like Jonathan Moulton and Daniel Webster proved a good match for Satan. But in Rhode Island, men of wit and courage were not challenged. Otherwise, the devil behaved in Rhode Island much as he did elsewhere. He assumed diverse shapes. He made compacts with the witches. He lent his name to caves and glens and other natural objects. He left giant footprints in numerous rocks. Popular fictions, taking their cue from the verbal portraits of evangelical Christianity, pictured him as a physical personality with constant attributes, a sly, wily, unscrupulous prowler for hell recruits. The indigenous people gave him another name, Hobomoko, and one of the best-known local legends in the state tells of events at the deep fissure in the rocks known as Purgatory. Local legends, such as this one, are tied to the landscape in which they arise. Most of them are invented to explain some uncommon feature in that very landscape, such as the case with Purgatory. 
Some legends give the devil credit for making this chasm, which is 160 feet long, from 8 to 14 feet wide at the top, and from 2 to 20 feet at the bottom. Hobomoko created it by merely stamping his foot, and it is said his footprints may be seen at low tide, just at the base of this fissure. Once, while the old woman was mumbling her devotions, she heard a rustling among the boughs. She turned around to see a very stern-looking English gentleman beside her. This man, who was really the devil in disguise, asked her to walk a short distance with him, but when the woman refused, saying that she had business in Wickford, he grabbed her by the arm and dragged her along. In a frightened voice, the woman called to Hobomoko to save her. I'm Hobomoko, said the gentleman, and immediately dropped his disguise. Seizing the unhappy woman by the waist, he made one or two fierce stamps on the ground, flew with his victim toward purgatory, and threw her into the chasm. Other sources give a more graphic description of the woman's death. When they landed near Purgatory, the woman showed fight, and the devil was forced to bump her head against the boulder, and finally to draw his tomahawk. He bumped and bumped, chopped and chopped, until he had chopped her head off, and then ran up the ledge with the body, and threw it into the chasm. As proof of this version, the bowl-like depressions on the ledge are described where he bumped the woman's head and the axe marks where the tomahawk struck. Another addition to the legend, which goes with the first version but not the second, is that the rocky walls of the fissure are marks, which are said to be prints of her fingers as she clung in her last frantic fight for life. The devil made many other visits to Rhode Island, leaving footprints on the ledge of a rock on the west side of the highway leading from Wickford to East Greenwich, where the railroad from Davisville to Quonset crosses it. Whatever the mission, he had his dog with him, and both were so hot that they left their marks in the hard granite. Higher on the ledge stands the devil's chair made of rock. A number of legends have grown up around this devil's foot rock. One story is that he stepped across to Devil's Foot from Connecticut Island on his way to Westerly. Another is that he came from Massachusetts, having completed the establishment of his kingdom there and headed for Connecticut to continue his labors. There are two guesses as to why he passed through Rhode Island so swiftly. One is that he was convinced he couldn't do any proselytizing in this state, and the other was that it was his already and he didn't have to linger. Satan did not always come to Rhode Island on evil missions. Sometimes he was just out for a good time, or perhaps to drop a reminder that he was still around, as in the case when he went skating with this old local. Old John Onion lived in the Charleston woods near the old Narragansett schoolhouse, located about a mile in back of the church, which is now called Schoolhouse Pond. He came down to the pond to skate one bright cold night, feeling mighty frisky. He had outskated all the other lads and had vowed he could outskate the devil. It wasn't long before he realized he wasn't skating alone. The faster and fancier he skated, this figure followed. He shouted, but no reply. Soon he recalled his vow of the earlier evening, and John asked no more questions. Breathlessly, he skated by him and disappeared. John did not stop to remove his skates, but skated right up the banks of the pond, right through the woods, and as fast as his legs could carry him, and on into the house. He never after tried out-skating the devil. Many people near Westerly believed that the devil visited the Sims house on the south side of the post road one dark, stormy night. The evening had been devoted to hilarity and coarse carousals, singing, storytelling, drinking, dancing, and wild frolic. The scenes closed by an unceremonious and sudden descent of the horned and grizzled monarch of darkness through the tunnel of the chimney, and his awful presence was accompanied by the tumbling of the main part of the chimney top into the rooms of the house. When the devil could not pay his respects personally, he oftentimes sent a personal emissary to do his bidding. One man with such a reputation was James McDaniel, who lived in Hopkington. His cocked hat, glaring eyes, and daring manner had won this reputation for him. 
McDaniel was also quite a fiddler, and when Amos Langworthy Jr. brought home his bride to his father's house, he wanted to fiddle for the newlyweds. Amos Langworthy Sr. refused the request because it was against his principles to have fiddling in his house. McDaniel was enraged and prophesied that the old father would yet be obliged to have fiddling under his roof. Shortly after, Mr. Langworthy's daughter, Amy, was seized with fits that nothing would allay but music. At the sound of the viol, she would recover and then dance for hours. Many came to witness the matter, and it was believed that Miss Langworthy was bewitched by McDaniel. At last, Mr. Langworthy hired a fiddler by the month, as his daughter had fits nearly every evening until she was visited by Mr. Mason of Connecticut, who had laid his hands upon her and prayed, after which she had no fits. But she was never fully recovered. Other spirits visited Mr. Langworthy's dwelling, entering locked rooms, deranging and polluting the dishes and milk pans. On one occasion, when riding in great haste for a physician, Mr. Langworthy dismounted to open the bars, and on remounting found his bridle reins tied in knots. McDaniel was not long a resident there. He came from New York and had been a drummer in the Revolution. Some actual events with a definite supernatural element, took place only to be explained years after the occurrence. But in the intervening years, the tales enhanced the belief in devils and ghosts and witches of the day. William H. Potter reported such a situation in the Narragansett Weekly of November 1860. During the Revolutionary War, Hannah Maxson and Comfort Cottrell, two girls then staying in the house of Esquire Clark of Westerly, were trying their fortunes and endeavoring to bring their bows by throwing each of her ball of yarn into the well and winding them off while they severely repeated a verse from the scriptures backwards. They completed their charm about dusk and went to the front of the house and there standing, awaiting the arrival of their sweethearts, or the result of their incantations, lo, they both saw a monster figure coming up the road. It was some eight or ten feet high, and marched with a stately step, but the eyes, as they said, were big as saucers, and breathing flames from its distended jaws. They saw it turn from the streets and approach the house, in consternation, they fled frantically. Esquire Clark, who was a pious man and not easily frightened, came in at the back door the moment the monster had mounted the front door step and was glaring steadily into the house through the panes of glass over the front door. The steady, unmistakable gaze of the demon convinced Mr. Clark at once that spiritual weapons were alone adequate to combat such an adversary. He immediately went into prayer, and the devil, meantime, left, never again reappearing to trouble the good man's house or the terror-stricken girls. Both became serious. One or both of them soon after found relief in a strictly religious life. No one knew the explanation for this incident for seventy years. Then it was revealed that a young Newporter, Dan Rogers, had been responsible for deceiving the two young ladies. Because of the delayed explanation, the story became part of Rhode Island's supernatural folklore. Such hoaxes were not uncommon, and tales of practical jokes carried the devil into 19th century humor. In his Johnny Cake stories, Tom Hazard reveals the escapade that gave the clearest spot in Wilson's Woods the appellation Devil's Ring. While crossing that spot, Richard Corey found himself suddenly seized by a great horned monster who promised to spare him on condition that he bring to the ring the next day a bigger liar than himself. Corey promised and sought out Paris Garner, who he attempted to cajole to be designated place with a story of kid's treasure. Paris, who is actually the devil, declared Corey such a liar that he wouldn't believe him and refused to go. Thereafter, Corey went the long way round Wilson's woods. Perhaps the devil's activities never made the headlines in local papers, but at least one vampire received more notoriety in 1892. 
exhumed the bodies, testing a horrible superstition in the town of Exeter, bodies of dead relatives taken from their graves. They had all died of consumption, and the belief that live flesh and blood would be found that fed upon the bodies of the living. That's from the Providence Journal, March 19th, 1892. This is not the first vampire active in Rhode Island. At the time of the Revolution, a farmer named Stuckley was the father of 14 children. He had frequently recurring dreams that half of his fine orchard died. Shortly afterward, his eldest daughter, Sarah, died, and in quick succession, five other children. When the seventh child became ill, the parents realized that a vampire was to blame. After due consideration, the six bodies were disinterred. Five were found badly decomposed, but Sarah's body was in good condition and her arteries were filled with fresh blood. Her heart was removed and burned. The seventh child was too ill to be saved, but the other seven Stuckleys reached maturity. There is no other account of vampires in the state until the above-mentioned one made the headlines in 1892. Mrs. Brown and her two daughters were buried behind the Baptist Church in the Chestnut Hill Cemetery. Apparently, they had died of tuberculosis within a comparatively short time of one another. A son and a brother, Edwin A. Brown, lived in West Wickford, and when he came down with the disease, his relatives discussed the situation. Out of this conference developed a conviction that his life was being sapped by visits from a vampire. Very likely, it was also responsible for the death of the other three members of the family and living in the grave of one of them. They dug up the bodies of the three women, removed their hearts, and burned them on a rock in the cemetery. The bodies were returned to their resting places. In the veins of one of the sisters, the old story goes, there was blood, proof of vampirism. Edwin Brown dissolved the ashes of the burned hearts in the medicine his doctor had given him. Apparently, it was not effective, because Brown died shortly afterwards. Although the devil and vampires did parade through the minds of former generations, tales about them are not as numerous as those of witches and ghosts. Thank you once again for joining us today at the Patuxent General. We have so many changes coming up, surprises and personal appearances. If you have any questions, ghost stories, or would like to reach out with a recipe, our email is jess at patuxentgeneral.com. We would love to hear from you, and we'll get right back to you. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxent General. A something for Posterity Production. Pre-recorded in Patuxent. <laughs>